This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here, and I'm back with another case set. So this time we're gonna go over five new questions for a patient. Okay, so for this case, we have a 39-year-old male, and his wife is saying that her husband is here to get a tooth taken out. Now, if we look further into the, his background, he suffered a gunshot wound to the head several years ago, and as a result of this head injury is now mute, was declared legally incompetent as well. And his wife is his legal guardian. So as far as dental findings, there's a chronic apical abscess associated with tooth number 19, was previously root canal treated, and has since experienced coronal fracture and endodontic failure. So with all of that background, let's go ahead and go through these five questions. So go ahead and pause the video, read through this question, and then we'll go over it together. Okay, so for this one, we need to have some basic understanding of some important legal terms. So a power of attorney is appointed by the patient and has legal power to make financial or healthcare decisions if the patient ever becomes incapacitated. So the patient still maintains the power to sign informed consent for themselves, or they can have the power of attorney do it. A legal guardian, on the other hand, is appointed by the court and is a substitute decision maker if a patient becomes incapable of making responsible decisions due to some mental disability. Once there's a legal guardian assigned, the patient is no longer allowed to sign legal documentation for consent. Now, since the court appoints guardians and not powers of attorney, we can rule out option D. A head injury could very well disable someone, and muteness was likely a result of that head injury. It means that the patient would not be able to verbally communicate, but we have an even better reason listed here. Legal incompetency means a lack of legal ability to do something, especially to testify or stand trial. Him being declared legally incompetent by means of a formal hearing was the direct catalyst for a legal guardian being appointed for him. So the answer here is C. All right, so go ahead and pause the video, read through question number two, and then we'll go over it together. So this is a popular kind of question to get on the new board exam, talking about the principles of ethics and giving you some scenario and asking you which principle was violated in that scenario. You'll get at least five to 10 of these on test day. Now this one happens to be fairly straightforward. If you tell the guardian that this patient does not need treatment, well, you know he certainly does need treatment. There might not be an urgent need for treatment right away, but the patient does need some kind of treatment eventually. There's a chronic apical abscess, an active infection with a failed previous treatment. So even if you don't feel comfortable extracting this tooth right now, you should at least refer to a specialist so they can pursue the proper treatment. And this would be a violation of veracity since we're required to communicate truthfully and without deception. That's what veracity means. And here we would not be telling the truth about his diagnosis if we told him that he doesn't need any treatment at all. In the Code of Professional Conduct, there's a clause called Representation of Care, and it states that dentists shall not represent the care being rendered to their patients in a false or misleading manner. In this case, if we were to tell them, hey, you don't need any treatment at all, you're good to go, don't worry about it, that would be a misrepresentation of their diagnosis and a failure to communicate truthfully the care that they really need. So the answer here is E. Okay, question number three. Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this one together. 
So this happens pretty frequently, especially with a surgical extraction where bone is removed by a handpiece. There are these sharp pieces of bone sticking up, and we don't want to leave it that way since it can be traumatic to the patient's tissues and inhibit healing. So what do we use to remove it other than a surgical handpiece? Well, a curette is a spoon-shaped instrument for scraping away soft tissue from the socket, but not for removing bone, so we can rule that one out. A hemostat is used to clamp blood vessels closed before suturing or cauterizing them, or for blunt dissection of soft tissue, as in an incision and drainage procedure. So that's not sufficient either. And forceps are used to grab firmly onto a tooth or a tooth root and luxate it out of the socket by expanding the bony alveolus and disrupting what remains of the soft tissue attachment. So that's incorrect as well. Rongeurs are double spring pliers used to trim interradicular bone. A bone file would also be an appropriate choice if that were listed, but the answer here is A. Okay, here comes question number four. Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this one together. So I know this is another type of popular question asking about flap procedures. So first, let's define what all of these different flaps are. A pedicle flap is basically a lateral repositioned flap. You move gingival tissue from one tooth and move it to an adjacent tooth to cover a nearby exposed root surface. Usually this is done in the mandibular anterior region to cover some isolated incidents of gingival recession. A Widman flap involves a series of incisions and provides access to subgingival areas for debridement with the goal of establishing some new attachment. A repositioned flap is a temporary flap to reveal an impacted tooth. You would bond a button in order to apply orthodontic traction to that tooth and then close the flap over the button and attached chain. It's indicated when the impacted teeth are too far apically to reposition the tissue permanently. And an apically displaced flap requires additional vertical releasing incisions made beyond the mucogingival junction so that you can permanently fix that flap in an apical direction in order to attain some type of pocket reduction. So crown lengthening surgery involves osseous resection, the removal of bone, to move the bone level more apically to allow for a healthy biologic width between the restorative margin of the eventual crown that's going on tooth number 18 and the bone level. It also often involves a gingivectomy to expose more of the tooth surface and ensure that the pocket stays at a healthy dimension that its depth doesn't get increased too much. But if the patient is short on keratinized tissue, that's less than two millimeters of keratinized tissue, you need to preserve that tissue they have instead of just cutting it off with a gingivectomy. In that case, instead, you would use an apically positioned or displaced flap to move the gingival margin down while preserving the keratinized tissue they already have. So if you just want to go with some high yield facts, if you see crown lengthening mentioned in the question and they're talking about a flap, apically displaced is what you want to go for. So the answer here is D. All right, and the last question of this case set. So go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this one together. All right, so this one is kind of a continuation from the discussion of the last question. The main objective for a flap procedure like the Widman flap is to allow access for cleaning the calculus and plaque from the roots of the teeth that would otherwise not be visually available or physically accessible, and reducing the bacterial load and removing the etiology of periodontal disease is the primary objective to treating it. The whole reason the periodontist determined that the patient 
is in need of this surgical flap procedure is because they were diagnosed with periodontal disease. The other answer choices are goals, but not the primary objective. For instance, it would be great to reduce or eliminate periodontal pockets, but that's a side effect of getting access to the roots. On the contrary, the main goal of osseous recontouring surgery is to eliminate periodontal pockets, but not doing this flat procedure. It would also be great to regrow alveolar bone or improve soft tissue contour, but again, those would be side effects of doing a flat procedure, not the primary objective. So the best answer here is going to be B. All right, so that's it for this case set, everyone. I hope you're enjoying these. I'm trying to make them cover multiple specialties in dentistry, enabling you to think critically about a certain case. So if you are enjoying them, let me know in the comments and I'll continue to make more for you. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you in the next video.